Now we're going to move on to some problems with how a study is framed in a journal article. The first problem is quite simple. If the introduction of an ERP paper doesn't include a concrete description of what patterns of ERP results would be predicted by the hypotheses being tested, then that's a big warning sign. A lot of ERP studies just involve taking a previous behavioral paradigm and having subjects perform the task while the EEG is recorded. That almost never leads to conclusive findings. Remember how all the different underlying components mix together at each electrode site? If you don't specifically design the experiment to isolate the component of interest, you probably won't have a very solid conclusion. You'll see differences in the ERPs between the conditions, but you won't know what they mean. A lot of ERP studies are fishing expeditions. The researchers just want to see what happens when they use a given task or manipulation. But if they don't have specific predictions, then they're probably going to look at the data before they decide what time windows and electrode sites to use. And that's a recipe for bogus but statistically significant effects. Fishing expeditions aren't always a bad thing. The first study in any area is usually a fishing expedition. I've certainly published some fishing expeditions like this one. You can tell it's a fishing expedition from the phrase electrophysiological correlates in the title. But if a study is a fishing expedition, you really want to see the results replicated before you believe them. For example, this paper had four experiments. Risa's study wasn't a fishing expedition. Even though she didn't expect the PD effect that she found, she did go into the experiment with some specific predictions. So here's how the intro to experiment one ends. First, we predicted an N2PC for the target, the large A. That was a no-brainer. Then we considered three possible outcomes for the salient singleton distractor. We didn't predict the PD effect, so we just listed three possibilities. One was that the singleton would produce an N2PC, which would have indicated that it automatically captured attention. Another possibility was that the singleton would produce no lateralized ERP activity at all, indicating that it didn't have any special status above and beyond the non-singleton distractors. Finally, we raised the possibility that the singleton would elicit a PD, indicating that it produced a saliency signal but was suppressed. This is what I mean when I say that an introduction should contain specific predictions. The final problem I want to point to is over-reliance on ERP source localization. Now, it's perfectly fine for a paper to include information about the plausible neural generator sources of their effects. They just need to be careful to say that the data are consistent with a particular generator source, rather than that the data demonstrate that a particular part of the brain is involved. If the researchers want to draw strong conclusions about the generator source, they would need to provide a principled quantification of the accuracy of the solution. After all, if you read a paper saying that mean reaction time was 50 milliseconds greater in one condition than in another, would you believe it if they provided nothing but the means? Wouldn't you need standard errors, confidence intervals, Bayes factors, p-values? You need an estimate of error with RT, so why shouldn't you require the same thing when someone tries to estimate the location of an ERP generator source? So now you know what to look for when you're reading ERP studies. There are lots of really great ERP studies, but there are also lots of ways that an ERP study can go wrong. And now you'll know how to tell the difference.